Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Digital Making at Home live stream. I'm Christina and I'm coming to you live from Nebraska. And I'm Matt and I'm in Ohio. Yes, Matt and I are from the Raspberry Pi Foundation and we're happy to have you here with us today. This live stream is all about all of us coding together. So before we jump in, please say hi in the chat. We want to hear from you. Let us know where in the world you are joining us from. We are broadcasting live to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch right now, and we'll be able to see your comments. So if you're watching on the ras on raspberrypi.org, you can click the title of this video and head over to YouTube so you can join the chat. For those of you who are new, first of all, welcome. We're so excited yeah. you're here. Digital Making at Home is all about getting young people just like you coding and creating with technology. Every week we chat with cool people, code together and see amazing digital making projects from kids just like you. So because of today, we are welcoming the coolest projects community to the live stream. So I'm really excited. And Coolest Projects is one of my favorite events. Matt, what is your favorite thing about Coolest Projects? I, so Coolest Projects is, is an awesome expo. It's a showcase of what young people create with technology. And I, I've gotten the chance to go to a few of these events and have seen so many amazing things, including that's where I met our guest, which is pretty cool. Yes, yeah, I, we've actually known our guest for a couple of years and with Coolest Projects and um, just our theme this week is making for social good and it just made sense to invite our guest here. So today we are chatting with Adarsh Ambadi from California. He's going to talk about his experience of Coolest Projects and the projects that he's made that have truly made a difference in the world. He's made a Raspberry Pi based smart sprinkler and a health monitoring project, both won accolades at Coolest Projects USA and recent recognition from judges at Coolest Projects International this past summer, so just a few months ago. So let's bring on Adarsh. Welcome, Adarsh. Welcome. Hi. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. We've got a ton you. of people here to see you. Hello to Gobal, Lou, Chris. It's great to have you on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, they're all They're all here to see you and hear about what you've got to say. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. yes. That's so great. I love like, that's my favorite thing is when friends and family jump on and say hi. So yeah. shout out to all of fr the friends of Adarsh and family. We're so <laughs> happy to have you here. Um, so let's, let's jump right in Adarsh. I would love to know, like we connected at Coolest Projects, but oh, actually the last two years at 2018 and uh, 20 or 2019 and definitely yeah 2020. And uh, I want to know just bef before we jump into Coolest Projects, what, how did you get started with computer program? That's always like my biggest question. Like, do you remember your first like computer program that you wrote? How did you get started? Yeah, so uh, my first experience with programming was in the fourth grade. I was really lucky enough to attend a school that had uh, early education in computer science. So I started with a lot of people with scratch programming. So it's like the block-based computer programming. And I don't know, just moving that sprite around with screen with like a few simple blocks was just so amazing to me. Um, and then after sprite, after uh, scratch rather, I moved on to uh, Python. Uh, and I just really wanted to continue to learn how to computing. Uh, so I started doing a lot more Python programming and my first ever Python program was the really simple hello world program and like just seeing the computer being able to spit out the words like hello world like it made me feel like I was directly talking to the computer. Yes, and I feel like so many so many people can connect with that, right? Just that moment of like, oh wait, I told the computer to do this and it did it. Like that's 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 incredible. Oh, do you remember your fourth grade computer science teacher by chance? Um I, I think I, I don't I remember I remember I don't remember the exact project I did, but I definitely remember the ton of memories I had. So we had like a small computer cart because in fourth grade we were just like the computer cart would come around to each class mm, and bring up right. a bunch of different computers with Scratch already loaded onto it. And I remember every time that computer cart came around, all of us were just so excited to oh, start opening up our laptops and start programming whatever fun thing that we were doing that day. Wow, that's neat to hear. Like you having a cart coming for me, I had to go to a, a build, like a room. There was a specific right, room that right. students had to like rotate to the computer lab. And, so it's and, and Romilly in the chat is saying their first experience in computer programming was in 1958. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> if you're in the chat, let us know when you started uh, your your journey with computer programming. 
Definitely. Well, let's talk about, so this week it is about making for social good. So I'd love to talk, I know this is something you have experience with, like we've seen some of your really neat projects and what was the first big project that you tackled? Yeah, so my first big project was the smart community sprinkler system. So essentially what it is, is that I was able to combine both moisture content information and weather forecasting data to like save water for um, like for most optimal amounts of water for an entire lawn. And the really cool thing about this for me is that it can save water for an entire community, not just one home. So because it has like the device itself has Twittering capabilities, it can determine like what percentage the lawn should water and tweet that out to the community. So like the residents can subscribe to the information just by following the account on Twitter and then use that information to like prevent water wasted during general purpose landscaping. Oh, wow. Well, that that's that's really neat because I think for me as a science, I taught science in California and we talked about the drought and we talked about wasting water a lot. That was a really especially when I was a teacher, it was a really big issue. How what did it look like to get started with that project and to like test it? Like, did did you just go knock on the doors of your neighbors and be like, hey, I'm trying like, what was that like? <laughs> Yeah, so for the like months of like building the device, I was really like tinkering with it and working on it. And I had a lot of help from my mentors, Johan Sosa, and like my teachers, my science teachers, especially, who I would give like a pitch to and then I would get feedback and come back and tinker with it. And so when I was finally ready to like take the device and start going around to my neighbor, I thought, why don't I try to pilot it in my own community first before like starting starting to put in any competitions or anything because I wanted to like validate it. So um, I had to go to my community and actually go door to door and knock on 10 homes, um, <laughs> which is really stressful for a sixth, seventh grader. And um, and I, I, I don't know, but I was just so lucky that I was able to get 10 people who or 10 homes that were willing to agree to my uh, pilot study and just follow the, the Twittering accounts. Um, and so, yeah, that's so neat and it's just so much appreciation to your neighborhood and to your community right because then that project doing that project and completing it brought you to cool's projects and that's how we met and so what what made you want to enter this project into cool's projects yeah so um actually right after like the initial successes of my projects I tried to reach out to like many different water companies, but like 11 to 12 year old, uh, like an 11 to 12 year old doesn't really have the credibility um, that water companies might trust. But um, so entering my, in, entering into like different competitions is kind of like my way of like trying to gain that credibility and like trying to improve the device as well. Like every time I enter a competition, my thought process was, if I won, my device would gain credibility. And if I didn't, I would get so much good feedback that I could go back and improve the device on my own end. Um, so there were many competitions that my projects didn't win any awards. And I was so actually, I was really glad for that because um, because of that, I was able to improve my device more and more. And then one day um, I, I um, received an email from the Broadcom Master Science Fair program um, for middle schools about the coolest projects competition. And because my project is based in Raspberry Pi, I felt like I owed it to myself to like, to join this competition because um, it's the Raspberry Pi and that's where the entire system is based around. So I joined the competition and I absolutely loved it. I mean, the ap atmosphere at my first ra the coolest projects competition was so electric and every the moment there was just so excited to hear about all the young code young coders and engineers so yeah wow yeah that definitely i think it describes our team is very definitely electric yes <laughs> and yes. just excited for sure and i i want to go back i love what you said about the piece where if you won like you would but also if you didn't win you would get a lot of feedback and that i think is something that's so important and it's really impressive to me that you as a young person recognize the value of like not winning that there's still that possibility for feedback and getting better to be honest when i was a young person like if i didn't win it was i was it was a mess <laughs> like i was Aww. not happy about it but i honestly when i came to the raspberry pi foundation something we talk about is failing f-a-i-l is your first attempt in learning and it's so neat to hear. And, and that I don't doubt is why you've been able to be so successful with this project. Because what happened after Coolest Projects? Yeah, so after Coolest Projects, um, I got a lot of like like um, attention to my project. And 
actually I'm starting to reach out to different communities now to see if like they're like actual water companies um, and I'm getting a lot more traction this time around um, because of the amazing credibility that Raspberry Pi Cools Projects competition gave me and unfortunately because of the COVID situation um, like that's kind of slowed down but uh, it was it was really cool to actually be able to see like because of the work that I put into it and because of coolest project as a whole, I was getting that attention. And um, and I, I definitely feel like that's one other reason why coolest project is something that all young coders should do or should attend is because, I mean, it's so amazing too. And you can get all that great attention for your project. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And there is the, so you, I know your first project with the sprinkler system was Raspberry Pi. This is the project you brought to 2020, which was another Raspberry Pi project. Can you tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah. Yeah, so this project is called a, um, it's got a really complicated title, but <laughs> essentially what it is, it's a contactless vital signs monitor. Um, and so there's some really cool techniques with it. It's called like photophotosmographic imaging. Um, Whoa. But, <laughs> yeah. but I first thought of, I first thought of this project um, and it actually it has like a kind of neat story along with it. So I first thought of the monitor um, after my mom, like she had a, third degree heart block and was going, had to go to the hospital. Um, so there I saw that she was like hooked up to so many different wires and uh, electronics. And a lot of these were just to detect her vital signs. And so these wires not only like physically hindered her recovery, but they also kind of acted as a mental impediment. Like, like it made her feel like that she wasn't as healthy as she actually was. Um, so after that, I heard about news, like just then news about like Ebola virus and a lot of contagious diseases started coming around the uh, to the news and it made it evident that like a need for a contactless vital sign uh, monitor is there like there is a need for it so after identifying the pro problem i'm like moved on to like applying my knowledge of biology and computer science through my raspberry pi projects uh to design a solution which ended up being my contactless vital signs monitor oh wow what kind of sensors did you use for it yeah so um Originally, my project is my contact as vital signs monitor is just a thermal sensor um, and an infrared camera. So it can detect five vital signs just from those two two different cameras. And that way, it's all contactlessly. It's all contact. So uh, contactless. Sorry. Um, yeah. So because it's really simple, there's two main there's just two main cameras and it can detect all the five vital signs. Like you can get rid of all those things, like having to have so many different wires for your project, for yeah. the vital signs. Can you explain that? Look, like how does it detect the vital signs without touching you? Like how is it yeah. going to measure my heart rate without touching me? Yeah. So um, for temperature, skin temperature, we use the thermal camera, um, and that's pretty simple. We just detect the skin temperature of the patient. Uh, heart rate is a little bit more complicated, so it's this technique called remote photophotosmography. And it's essentially like if you have a Fitbit or anything, it's mm -hmm. the same principle of how Fitbit is able to detect your heart rate just from a distance, right? It's the remote aspect of it. So essentially the camera is able to like look at you in your uh, video feed and split it into like the green, red and blue light. So we isolate the green light and we use OpenCV software to isolate the forehead region. Um, and because that's where a lot of blood vessels are. And um, if you want to think of it like this, so as the heart expands, there's a lot more blood in the heart and there's less blood in like the peripheral capillaries or the blood vessels in your forehead. And then when the heart contracts, there's more blood in your forehead and more blood means that there's more red color. So more green light is being absorbed. So there's like super slight fluctuations in green light that are relate back to how the heart expands and contracts. And if you use like certain optical techniques, you're able to capture that. And that's what essentially what the principle of remote photophotosmography is. And that's how we're able to capture the heart rate. Uh, but what another thing that was really found was that like, in that wave of fluctuations, it's actually a composite wave. There's so much more information than just the heart rate. You can actually capture things like the respiratory rate um, and you can use the heart rate to um, predict what your blood pressure might be. And even um, you can use the red and blue light to detect blood oxygen levels. So that's kind of like how we detect all five vital signs in a simple like manner like of explaining it, but um, yeah. 
Well, I'm still processing. <laughs> That's so w wow. Like <laughs> that was that. I, I'm curious, like, did you know about? Oh, do you have something to say, Matt? Go ahead. I was gonna say the chat is going <laughs> wild here for you, Alex, Romilly, Gobal, all of them are cheering for your 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 yeah. great project. So, Adarsh, did you? How did you learn about all of that? Like, was this something that you you gained this knowledge having supported your mom when she was in the hospital? What research, or did you have to do research to 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 develop this understanding of how to actually use this these monitors? Yeah, so I can definitely say that I am no technical expert in, in any of these uh, uh, principles, but um, after identifying the problem, I set out to doing research. So actually, I would say the majority of my time doing this project was research. And, and that's true for almost any engineering project is you need to figure out how you're actually planning to do it before you can start coding it, right? Um, and so I had to do the research. I had to find like these obscure papers on photophotosmography. And then um, for, I think the, the one that was the hardest were like blood oxygen levels and blood pressure because those aren't traditionally remote. Like you have to have like a sensor that's touching you. Uh, so I think we, we were, I was able to like look through many different research papers. And I think I ended up finding like a thesis paper, not even a published research paper that like was able to, you know, model how blood pressure works based off the heart rate, your height, your wage, your weight, and your age. Um, and because of that, I was able to use, incorporate it into um, the project. So the most important factor to me for building this was definitely by far researching and just pouring hours over the different articles and um, research papers. Wow, man. And, and in terms of, I remember actually using this, this uh, device in, <laughs> yeah, in March when we had Cole's projects and trying it out. And oh, there's us, oh, we were such babies. <laughs> this was only seven months ago for the record to <laughs> folks watching. <laughs> but yeah, and this is actually a photo because you won, this was the first time we ever did this. You won our overall winner for Coolest Projects USA. Because this project, I think the judges were just absolutely blown away by it. So again, like just congratulations on that. And I'm just, what little babies we were. <laughs> Such a new time. How, what? So as you're talking through all of what, like if we now thinking about like some of the kids who are watching, what coding language did you use to create this project? Like how yes. did you result in these measurements happening from the sensors? What, what was the middle piece? Yeah, so um, I can talk a little about both projects. So the Sprinkler project was almost all Python. It was, um, I think the only couple of times was like when I was writing a cron job just to like time the program. Uh, but uh, I was, that was like my first ever big project and I was only like really confident in Python. Um, so when I came around to do the Contactless Vital Science Monitor, I also started putting the majority of the work in Python. So all the video cameras and uh, the main part of the program that, that converts all the video feed into um, in, in, in video feed into the vital signs is all in Python. Um, just some of the sensors like the MLEX Nano 640, the thermal IR sensor, like they, that has to have like some C. So I had to code in that. And that's where like my mentor came in because I'm by no means an expert in C. So I had to get a lot of like help with that. Um, but yeah, so that's what the thing is like, if you know one language really well, you're able to like, code so much in that language because any language is versatile if you know how to like use it really well. So um, I really know how to use Python. Like that's my favorite language. I think it's like really intuitive. Mine too. And, yeah, <laughs> it's just Python. really intuitive for me. Um, and so that's what I decided to code both of my projects on. Wow. A hammer frog in, on Twitch is asking about the model of Pi you used and more about the hardware. Yeah, so um, I think I used the Raspberry Pi 3B for my sprinkler mm -hmm. project, and I used the new Raspberry Pi for my uh, uh, heart rate monitor just because I wanted like the new yeah. Uh, one. Yeah, just because <laughs> the newer model always works better. But yeah, um, yeah, I used the, that's what I used for the Raspberry Pi. Um, and then I think for the sprinkler uh, system, I had one, the, I had a sensor, the moisture sensor. Um, and that was the one that, you know, you had to have if you want to do a moisture sensor based sprinkler project. Um, but 
the really cool aspect for both the projects to me was the software more than the hardware just like being able to like use the different api language the apis and using that to like the fullest extent like this for the sprinkler project the twitter api um to like tweet out the information and then using the the python programming to like convert the video feed into the vital signs which is something that i thought was really cool yeah, definitely. And I think what you were saying about like you done you did a lot of research and you also had a mentor. And I think that's so important for young people to hear that th these projects don't just come out of thin air from one person. There's an inspiration for you. It was your community. It was your mom. And then there's asking for help. And that is such an important part of, and getting help and like working with other folks like that is a big part of coding a big part of making is is that community piece and that's that's why i love coolest projects because there's that when kids come and they share their projects you connect with folks you hear their ideas like you said you get feedback from judges like that's that's such an amazing part of it and it's so neat and i appreciate you coming on and just talking about like it i, I had to do research <laughs> i had a mentor like i had I needed help and that's so important because Hopefully in the future, you're going to be able to help another young person come up with a really neat project. Yeah. I'm curious for folks, make sure to let us know. I know we're getting a lot of shout outs. If you have any questions, we love getting yeah. your questions in the chat. There's a few. So um, Alex was asking about the mentors. Um, how, how many have you had since you got started with, you know, coding? Yeah. So I really had one really great mentor for computer science and yeah. he, um, his name is Johan Sosa and I actually met him in a really unique way. So um, I can talk a little bit about that. So in the sixth grade, um, I I, ha I have an older brother, by the way, his name is Verdon Ambadi, just a shout out. So shout out. Um, shout out. Yeah. Uh, so my brother, who's like really big into biology um, and in, in like, actual biotechnology, he goes to this community lab when he was in high school and I was in sixth grade. And I really just wanted to tag along with him just like mm -hmm. to be the annoying little brother just to see what it, what's going on there. Um, and so I used to accompany him to this community lab called BioCurious. And I really yeah. wanted to do a lot of like biotech stuff with him, um, but I was just so young. So I couldn't like actually do any of the lab work there because there were age restrictions, things like that. Right. But then over there, I met so many cool people who were like, hey, if you don't want to, if you can't start doing uh, bio stuff, why don't you start doing computer science? And so the one of the persons there, his name is Johan Sosa, he is a trained computer scientist, and but he does DIY biology. So like for, because he just loves cool. it. And he introduced me to the Raspberry Pi and I'm so thankful for everything that he did because <laughs> So the are we. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he he introduced me to the Raspberry Pi and that's how I got started doing like these low cost projects because of both the versatility of the Raspberry Pi but also because it's just so cheap that anyone can pretty much program on it. Um so yeah. That's great. And hey, go ahead. Yeah, I would recommend like if you have a local lab or a uh like a computer lab near you by a community a place where a community can just come together and do different projects, whether it's biology or whether it's computer right. science. Yeah. There's just so many different cool people that you can meet there who could one day become mentors on like all of your different projects. So, yeah. And, and Romilly on Facebook is asking about your projects and whether you're sharing them on GitHub, are you sharing the source code out? Are you keeping that to yourself for now? Yeah, so I'm actually I'm planning on sharing the sprinkler project um, yeah. on GitHub. Uh, I'm thinking of trying to you know make the vital science monitor into a company uh, somewhere right. down the line. Um, but yeah. the the community sprinkler project is I'm definitely going to plan on sharing that on GitHub. I haven't done that yet, so I, it's one of the task lists. Um, <laughs> just because that is a it's a community centered project, so right. I feel like the entire community should have that. That's great. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's really neat. To, like, I mean, having you come on the stream, but we also noticed like you've been in some articles, you've also been in some podcasts. What has it been like to be getting so much positive attention for something you created? Yeah. So um, I, I, it just feels like amazing to, that my work is being validated and approved by some different experts and leaders in their respective fields. And to an extent, it kind of feels like, is this really happening? Like, I, like, I feel like I don't know. Um, like, it's not like, I feel like my project is good and all, but um, it's kind of also a little bit scary too, like that I might not like live up to the expectation in the next project and things like that. But, you know, whenever that thought like crosses my mind, I just, 
you know, like to remind myself that projects aren't like inherently successful. Like they have to come across like these different failures and then grow from there. Like none of my projects were successful or good even just to begin with. But like after multiple rounds of criticism and then thinking about it and then tinkering, I was able to enhance them to like where they are today. So yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Or I, Cause I'm a maker too. I've created things. Nothing as advanced as you have, but like that feeling of you get a great one and lots of people are excited about it. And the next one you make, it doesn't stick or there's something that, but you, you truck on, you keep trying things. It's great. Yeah. yeah. That's so important. I, I've heard that a lot, like in both the making community, but also like in the art community, if you have right. a film, a screenplay, a book, like you're like, Oh, well, okay. It's good. Now what do I do? And <laughs> right. like, can I make another one that meets this one? And, and like, I think it's so great that you identified a dark that like, okay, I'm just going to keep trying. I'm going to value that feedback and knowing that what you first put out there is not going to be what you end up with. Like what you first started with when you first created your sprinkler system is not what ended up at Cool's project. There was so many iterations and that's such an important part of it. And it's, it's really that like determination and focus is such an important, like you, yeah, you have the ideas, ideas, but you have to be willing to take the feedback and modify and really do that work. Yeah, yeah for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, what what are you thinking about next? Like we started with you talking about sixth grade and I know you are a junior now. What are you thinking about in terms of an education like career path? Yeah, so for me, I am planning on going into environmental engineering. Um, so I just really love computer science, computer engineering, the environment and biology. And so I feel like the total encompassing of all those three different fields, which are really spread out, is environmental engineering. And it's this really interdisciplinary field, but I feel like you can make a lot of impact on it because there's just so many, there's, I think like the environment is one space where computer science is like heavily needed to develop and engineer these projects um, in order to actually help better the environment and the climate as a whole, because that's a problem that we're all dealing with that we that needs to be solved. Yeah. Is, is this something, so our theme of like making for social good and you talking about like environmental engineering, is this something that's always been a passion of you? Was there an event or was there a person that got you really interested in, in clearly like your investment in the community and just really helping, helping the world? <laughs> yeah. So um, I think, I think actually it all comes back down to like the root of my sprinkler project so like that to me started like my interest in um like the environmental sciences so it was like like one day like when we were just going to school and then the rain like this is back when california was still experiencing that like record-breaking drought and like so many people were had to like cut off their water supply and cities were like incurring like fines like for people like yeah. if you have runoffs on water like you're gonna be fined um and i don't know just for me to like being able to experience that and to being able to see like like I have a creek in front of my house and every day before school, before the drought, I would like hear like all the frogs and the crickets creaking, uh, uh, croaking. But then like when the drought hit, all that went away. And it's like I can actually experience the effect of climate change and changes in the environment in real time. Um, and so that really hit home for me. And that instilled in me like the understanding of the environment. Um, and then, of course, for my interest in biology, it was when my mom had that third degree heart block because I was able to like see real time, like the effect that biology and the uh, things that like medicine and healthcare can have on like saving lives. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it says a lot of like personal experiences have really like driven you towards the work that you've done, the projects you've made and your career path. So I think that sounds like something for like young people, like go with your passions, your personal experiences. What other advice do you have someone, maybe someone who's just getting started with digital making or coding? What would you yeah. tell them? Yeah, for sure. So anyone who's just starting off with digital making and coding, I would say start by learning the basics first and beginning to code like super small projects that are just fun for you. Like, like my first ever project was like just making a scratch game or this the hello world program that we talked about like it doesn't have to be anything like to save the world or anything just yet right, right? right. but it, it's just that you can get your interest in computer science and start developing those skills 
And then I will also like to say like online today, there are so many different free resources that exist if you really want to like increase your capacity for computer science. And that is also if like your school doesn't provide like programming classes themselves. Um, another really useful strategy that I just really like to recommend is uh, going to join clubs like your community labs, like by Curious, or even like if you have a Coder Dojo nearby, yeah. um, like they're like really helpful because not only do you get to learn about the techniques themselves, but you get to meet like this mind share of like so many people around you that, and all the cool projects that they are working on. And you can learn from that too. Uh, like these organizations, they have like this wealth of knowledge that you can just tap into and just learn from there. So like just exposing yourself to more about like the computer science in the field is how you develop the interest in programming and then you develop the skills and then you then you can see that like problems in the world and use those skills that you've developed to actually solve them wow great advice oh, such good advice <laughs> i'm also going to personally take that advice yes. yeah. oh my gosh well thank you so much adarsh like this has been so much fun i'm sure you're getting more shout outs Yes. Yes. <laughs> tons of tons of people in the chat love your work and they'll be following you. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adars, for joining us, for telling us about Cool's projects, for sharing about your projects. It it really meant a lot to just be able to connect with you again. We haven't seen each other in seven months and I can't wait till we can we can reunite yeah. in person for sure. It was so good to see yes. you. Yeah, thank it was you. great to see you all. And I love this conversation. It was so fun. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Uh, okay. Bye. Um, Oh, that was awesome! Yes. Oh, it it just reminds me how much like I miss the like the coolest projects community like that. Yeah. That was our last event. That was like our last event before the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Before yeah. it all hit, so it's really it was really neat to connect with folks. And if if you're part of the coolest projects community, don't be afraid to reach out. We'd love to right. hear from you. We'd love to know what you're up to. It it means so much to get to see folks like Adarsh who've created a project and have gone on to take the feedback and like what they've learned from the event to continue on with their project. It's it's really amazing. It's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, Adarsh. Thank you to our coolest projects community for joining us for this stream. Yeah. And it was so great to see so many of you folks connecting with us at home. Yeah, shout out to Gobal, Romilly, Alex, Rakesh, uh, Hammerfrog on Twitch. Oh, we got people on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, Two Face Titan on Twitter, <laughs> Great Lou name. on Facebook. A ton of you have joined us, and we really appreciate you joining us for Digital Making at Home. It's 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 a lot of fun, especially when you're able to 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 chat with us. Yes, yes. Thank you all so much. And if you're inspired like me, and you want like a to try and just get started with a social good project. We actually have a project, a water use calculator project. So you can go to rpf.io slash water. And this is a scratch project where you can make a water usage calculator to help people think about how much water they use. And then you're also gonna write code that draws a chart to compare the amount of water used in various like different activities. So as a science teacher in California, I know I mentioned that like I talk with students about water usage. And so this is a really great pro project to get started. So definitely check it out. That is all we have time for this week, but don't worry. We have another live stream next week, same time, same place. Thank you all for being here for the Raspberry Pi Foundation's Digital Making at Home live stream. You can go to rpf.io slash home to check out past streams, to connect with us. And I hope we'll see you next week. Until then, stay safe and healthy. Bye. Bye.